Okay, everyone, welcome to this webinar on uh, mast cells and mold on us. My name is Dr. Sandeep Gupta, I'm the creator of Mold on us Made Simple course, and uh, very excited to have Dr. Jill Carnahan here today from, from Colorado. How are you, Jill? Wonderful this evening. Thanks for having me, Dr. Gupta. Great. And we've got a, an interesting topic to get through today, and we've got a bit of an itch that we're going to need to scratch, and uh, and that is the topic of mast cell disorders. And I understand you've been taking quite a lot of interest in this disorder for, for a number of years. I have. It's, uh, it's amazing how many people have this, and it's one of those things, like we mentioned, once your eyes are open to it, you can't not see it. Yeah, great. It, it seems to be like that with a, a whole bunch of different areas in integrative medicine. Uh, in that once once you start seeing something you start seeing it more and more and yeah. uh, and, and it's amazing the more different nuances we see in our patients the more the spectrum of colors start opening up to us so I'm very excited to discuss this one little new hue of the spectrum absolutely uh, great so if we could just have that slide show up uh, thanks Okay, well, while, while we're waiting for the slideshow to come up, uh, if everyone might care to just take a moment to close any uh, browser windows that they may have and, uh, and, and grab a glass of filtered water and uh, really just give us their full attention for this next hour or hour and a half or so because this is going to be some, some really interesting information that, that's not very widely available. Great. Next slide, thanks. And next one. Okay, so just uh, introducing a little bit about Dr. Jill. Uh, many of you would already know Dr. Jill from her work in uh, the Institute of Functional Medicine and many of the other different conferences she presents at regularly. But really, uh, Dr. Jill is a functional medicine expert who treats the root cause of uh, disease and illness. And uh, really, this whole area of functional medicine seems to be rapidly getting more attention and wavelength as I guess more and more chronic illness appears to be coming up and uh, I'm not sure what you're finding Dr. Jill but it seems to me that this this new paradigm of functional medicine it appears to just be much more well suited to deal with a lot of these complex chronic illnesses that we're finding. Yes and even among colleagues I'm sure you see the same I have a lot of colleagues they went to medical school with and now they're starting with their family or themselves finding uh, where conventional medicine fails them, like in chronic disease, diabetes, obesity, and some of these inflammatory conditions. And a lot of them are seeking more information and really functional medicine has some of the best answers to these really complex conditions that we're talking about. Great, thank you. Yeah, and so Dr. Jill did her medical degree in Loyola University, and prior to that did a Bachelor of Science in Bioengineering at the University of Illinois. Did I ever tell you, Dr. Jill, that I lived at the University of Illinois when I was seven years old for one year? No, I didn't know that. Oh, that's <laughs> Champaign-Urbana. Yes. <laughs> and you pronounced it right. <laughs> the Illinois. No, no S. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so Dr. Jill is also board certified in family medicine and integrative holistic medicine. Uh, she's also a certified practitioner by the Institute of, of Functional Medicine, which she is now a regular lecturer at. Uh, she initially founded a Methodist Center for Integrative Medi Medicine, and that was in Boulder. Is that correct? Actually, yeah. Peoria, Illinois, before I moved to Boulder. Ah, okay, right, great. And then now she's moved to to yes. to Boulder, Colorado, and has uh, has founded her own clinic, Flatterer on Functional Medicine. It's actually ju it's just outside Boulder, isn't it? Yes. Great, and uh, and uh, I'm amazed to hear that you have a three-year waiting list, and so unfortunately, Dr. Jill is uh, is not available for new patients at this time. But you're probably more likely to bump into her at a conference. Uh, the, and uh, interestingly and amazingly, um, Dr. Jill has beaten breast cancer, Crohn's disease, and SIRS. Uh, so the universe has given you a little bit of a crash course in uh, in medicine. I understand. <laughs> and uh, actually, that is a really important thing, I think. And I found like Dr. Raj Patel in our last uh, webinar mentioned that he himself had been through Lyme disease and SIRS. And, and one of the, the things about that is that it allowed him to understand a lot of the nuances of treatment yeah. that he probably wouldn't have been able to understand otherwise. And uh, I don't know if, that, if you found that to be the same kind of principle, having suffered many of these conditions yourself. Yes, um, 
Absolutely. As you obviously experience it yourself, there's so many little things that you put together because we know what's taught and then we know how we felt and what things happened and what got us well. And there's even tricks in getting well that I learned that are not written up anywhere or necessarily guidelines. And um, I found them successful with my patients as well. So it is a whole different experience when we go through it ourselves. Yeah, it kind of gives that whole different first person uh, perspective to illness and rather than just sitting on the other side of the desk and uh, yeah. and kind of, you know, and, and being firmly in a second person perspective where we're, we're really reading academic signs and so on, it, I guess it gives us much more of a, a 3D perspective yes. on, on, on patients and what they're suffering. So I think that's, that's really amazing that you've been through all those things and, you, and you're now doing so well. Uh, and uh, you can find out more about Dr. Jill at her website, jillcarnahan.com. Also, she has a, a really interesting guide to mold illness, which you can download at that website. Yes. Thank you. Uh, a little bit about me. Most of you already know me, uh, who have been following the, the the Mold Illness Made Simple webinars for some time. But as you know, I graduated here in Australia from from the University of Queensland, and uh, and worked in intensive care medicine for around about five years, uh, where I also had a, a little bit of a health journey of my own after getting uh, shigellosis while in America, and uh, and having to to repopulate my gut after taking very strong antibiotics, and that was my first. Uh, I guess my first uh, introduction into the world of, of functional medicine and realizing that uh, we need to take a more more holistic approach to achieving health rather than you know simply strong symptomatic treatments and uh, since then I, I, I gradually transitioned over into integrative medicine doing doing basically similar thing to what dr. Jill had done doing a, uh, a fellowship in, in in general practice and also in nutritional and environmental medicine at the same time and I've now got my own holistic medicine practice on the Sunshine Coast in Australia and, and also in Sydney um, I also do Skype consults wor worldwide um, being certified in the in the shoemaker protocol after I had a little bit of a mold. Uh, adventure myself and we have you guys seem to get a lot of flooding over there at times uh, I understand you've just had some major floods in Texas well mm -hmm. I um, I myself had a house flood up on the Sunshine Coast in 2012 and uh, my partner at the time got very unwell and so I, I basically did not have any framework to understand what was going on and so that led me to, to seek out Richie Shoemaker and, and and Skype with him at 1 a.m. in the morning mm -hmm. um, every every month or so and um it was a real journey like when when i first started talking with him i had no idea what he's talking about uh he was just giving you know he was mentioning c4a and tgf beta one and <laughs> fisteria and uh, it was like it was just the it was more than a steep learning curve it was a vertical learning curve and uh <laughs> in some way that that's why i i had so much passion to create this course and, um, and I was also lucky enough to be a co-author of this physician's consensus statement on CARS with some of the other certified physicians, Dr. Ackley Bernstein, Rapper Paul McMahon, and Dr. Shoemaker himself. And uh, I have quite a number of websites, but one of them is lotusholisticmedicine.com.au. Thank you, Caleb. Okay, would you, so jumping into the main topic here, would you like to start on this one, Dr. Jill, and maybe talk to us a little bit about what exactly are mast cells for those who don't know, and, and, and what do they do in the body? Sure, so mast cells are part of our force of protection, part of our immune system, and these are critical. Um, we couldn't survive without them, but when mast cells go bad, then we have these mast cell disorders. And historically, what's very interesting is there's been a, a disease we were taught in medical school called mastocytosis and this is actually more of a clonal disorder of the blood cells in the bone marrow where your body produces excess mast cells and again it's almost like a precancerous type of condition so again in medical school Dr. Gupta and I were taught about this but we never saw it very often in clinical practice and because of that you know it was a rare kind of zebra type of disorder which is what we call things we don't see very often but what we're seeing now is this mast cell disorder where it's not a clonal or proliferation, so it's not a multiplication of these cells, it's an activation of these cells. And that's a real big difference because tonight we're going to talk a lot about the triggers and the things that can activate mast cells. And even though these things are protectors, 
um, they can go bad and they can cause a ton of symptoms. And as you can see in the slide, these are found in every tissue in the body. So everything from the heart to the digestive tract to the brain to the gut to the um, skin can manifest with problems when you have mast cell disorders. And just like many of these chronic and inflammatory conditions like sears and mold um, exposure, it can affect nearly every system in the body. And it gets very confusing for physicians who don't know what they're looking for because it can manifest with palpitations or diarrhea or brain fog, and those are obviously lots of different systems in the body. So that's just a little bit about mast cells, and what we're talking about tonight is not really that mastocytosis, the clonal disorder, but we're talking about this mast cell activation. So what's the difference? The difference is basically when those mast cells get irritated. It's almost like they get poked by some environmental trigger. When that happens, and this could be mold, which is our main topic tonight, but it could also be things like heat or cold. It could be an allergen. It could be an environmental trigger like a toxin, like a heavy metal or a toxic exposure. And many, many chemicals and other things can trigger mast cells. And in these patients who have these activated or irritated mast cells, many, many different things can trigger their activation and cause the symptoms all over the body. Great. So uh, would another way of putting it be that mast cells are, they're actually a, a good part of our immune system. They're a normal part of our immune system, but under certain circumstances, they become irritated or they become activated because they're, they're overwhelmed in a sense by what's happening in the body. Would that be a fair, simple summary? That's a great way to say it. Yes, absolutely. Great. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Thanks. Okay, great. So as you said, Dr. Jill, there's, there's, a whole, there's a whole range of different mast cells disorders. And, uh, and really, um, mast cell activation syndrome is something that was first described in the early 90s, but it was not first named and actually officially, um, I guess, uh, described until around 2007. Would you like to talk a little bit more about how mast cell activation syndrome sure. fits into the spectrum of mast cell disorders? Yeah, so just like what I mentioned before, what you can see at the top of the slide is that the primary mastocytosis is the thing that we are typically, these are like clonal disorders and activation where there's proliferation and where the body just creates, just like if you had a bone marrow leukemia where your white blood cells um, proliferate and you make too many white blood cells. In this case, in those clonal disorders, your body makes too many mast cells. And that's a whole different problem because that's rare and it's actually, um, it's not usually triggered by a chemical irritant. What we're talking about tonight is more this irritation or I just think of it as you poke a bear and you're poking the mast cells with a chemical or trigger or mold or toxic chemical. Um, we were just talking before the webinar started. We think that um, most likely according to the research mold and according to talking to the experts, mold is probably the number one trigger to mast cell disorders like the MCAS that we're talking about. And the difference is this is not a proliferation of those cells. This is an irritation and an activation of those cells. So you may have the same number of cells but they become irritated and they pour out out all the things listed in that previous slide, prostaglandins and histamine and cytokines and uh, complement split products. And typically we think about mast cells and histamine because histamine is a huge player. But the honest truth is hundreds of chemicals have been measured for mast cells and it has a wide range of activities and there's more than just histamine that's involved. Great. Thank you for that explanation. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the, the symptoms of, of mast cell activation syndrome. And it's, it's interesting to notice that just like uh, CRS, which is our, uh, you know, um, the main syndrome related to mold that, that, that's known in the community at the moment, uh, MCAS appears to, to affect almost every, t uh, every organ of the body, and it's very widespread. And uh, I'd love if you could share a little bit more about what some of the symptoms of MCAS are. Sure. And, you know, I teach frequently with Dr. Dale Bredesen on, on reversing Alzheimer's disease. And that's relevant because the number one symptom we see with mast cell activation is actually neurocognition. So memory, focus, attention, brain fog, which are obviously common in Sears as well. And I want to emphasize that because we think about the skin and the heart and some of these things I'll talk about in a moment. But the number one symptom is actually brain symptoms, brain fog, focus, concentration, and memory.
and that's very common with SEERS as well. As you will recognize when we describe these symptoms, a lot of it overlaps with SEERS. And what uh, Dr. Gupta and I were talking about earlier is SEERS is treatable in a methodical approach, and according to the Mold Illness Made Simple um, program, there's a great way to address this. But when people don't get well, sometimes this MCAS, the mast cells have been activated, and that's part of the problem that lingers on. Things like flushing and rashes, all the classical histamine types of stuff on the skin. The skin may be the organ that has the most mast cells, so we often see, um, Dr. Gupta, I don't know if you've seen, but I know in a lot of my Sears patients, they will have hives and flushing and lots of skin reactions, mm. especially if they get in contact with mold or if they're detoxing from mold, they will often have skin reactions. Cardiovascular is perhaps the most dangerous because these people can drop blood pressure. They can become very, very hypotensive. They can become hypertensive. And something we see very frequently with Sears as well is the POTS, the postural orthostatic mm -hmm. hypotension syndromes, where they can't regulate their autonomic volume and they'll get dizzy or lightheaded when they stand up quickly. Um, the heart racing, of course, is another common one. We mentioned the brain fog, but also headaches and migraines can be common. And mood disorders are extremely common. So forms of anxiety and depression, irritability, or um, anything along those lines. The GI system is profoundly affected as well. And I'm, I'm going from memory, but I would guess second to the skin, the GI tract probably has the most, second most mast cells. And very frequently people have um, diarrhea, acute diarrhea, abdominal pain, um, uh, constipation, uh, nausea, and discomfort, like even gastritis types of symptoms. This can affect hormones. So women um, may have menstrual cramps or irritability or PMS types of symptoms. And respiratory, very frequently affected. Um, histamine, of course, is a player in allergies and asthma. So we see sinus congestion, those mucous membranes with histamine fill up with congestion and fluid. We can see edema, which can cause respiratory distress, shortness of breath, wheezing. Um, and then systemic fatigue is extremely common. And then because histamine is, a, is something that causes both brain, blood-brain barrier permeability, mast cell permeability, and gut permeability, we frequently see more food allergies, sensitivities, and symptoms that go along with this kind of leaky membrane concept. Wow. So, so really, it's, it's, it's a very widespread syndrome. And uh, it's interesting to note that some of the symptoms are more specific, like the, the classic skin rashes and sneezing and itching. But in some cases, like with the fatigue and the abdominal pain, it may actually in be in, in some cases quite difficult to differentiate whether symptoms are, are, are just due to generalized inflammation or due yes. to, to mast cell. Uh, activation, I imagine. And and do you do you find that there's any particularly helpful ways for someone who's got like a, a multi-symptom, multi-system disorder to differentiate how much of their symptoms may be, may be due to like a, a simple SERS type process versus, uh, versus chronic infections versus MCAS? Oh, what a great question, because I know you and I grapple with this every single day in our patients of what, what piece is playing the biggest um, part in their illness. And what's interesting is we know that uh, triggers for mast cell activation syndrome are both infections and toxins. And I know in my clinical functional medicine practice, infections and toxins are the two biggest players by far. And that would include mold, of course. And so these are triggers. And, and since we see so many patients with hidden and occult and heavy burdens of infections and toxic load, um, a lot of them have mast cell stuff as well. Differentiation is really trial and error. And as you're going to find with this whole presentation, there's no one magic test and there's no one magic treatment. I wish there were, but it is a lot of trial and error. And so um, we'll talk about some of the solutions and treatments. And what I'll usually do is do some trial with antihistamine and treatments and see if the patient resolves symptoms. Great. Okay. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And, and in some cases, it just sounds like by going down, like for instance, if a, a SERS patient for instance, has gone down the, the the traditional protocol with using cholestyramine and eliminating their Marcons and and doing some of the the various intermediate steps and and also VIP nasal spray. Uh, perhaps if they start noticing there's an increase in 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 some of these specific symptoms, uh, particularly around skin rashes and itching and that sort of thing, is that a situation where you may think that that a SERS patient should start considering about? Uh, MCAS as a possible contributory factor? 
Yeah. And you know, um, if you don't mind, Dr. Gupta, I will bring yeah. in a little personal experience because I think this yeah. is very relevant. This is one reason why I'm so interested in this as well. Um, we, you mentioned in the beginning, 2014, my office flooded and I had a massive mold issue. I didn't know about it for several months. And when I found out, of course, I moved and I did the shoemaker protocol to get well. Today, I'm 99% better. I still have to be careful to avoid massively moldy environments. But the 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 um, important point is when I got out of the situation and I started to detox, so I started, I got out of the exposure to the mold, I left the office, and then I started um, binders. What I noticed for about two months, I had almost total body hives. And it was very severe. Obviously, I knew how to deal with it, and I took antihistamines, and it controlled it. In hindsight, I had massive mast cell activation in the detox. So as the mold was trying to eliminate from my body through the treatment and getting out of the exposure, I actually had this syndrome in a very severe way. I had the brain fog. I had um, respiratory and GI distress. But on my skin, literally from my neck down, I was covered in hives. And so yeah. I've experienced this firsthand, and I know how that can be and how scary it can be. And that was part of the Sears process and part of the treatment. I no longer have that severity of reaction, but people who are prone to mast cell activation are going to be prone to it from any sort of trigger. So for example, I am going to be more prone to hives in reaction to some environmental chemical or some airborne exposure like VOCs, even now to this day, and so are our patients. They're going to be more prone to that when they get exposures. Okay, great. So that's a really, really practical example. And so for instance, when that happened to you, when you were taking uh, binders and you started getting hives, did you have to go on a sidetrack for some time and, and treat more the mast cell side of things uh, before you could go back onto the, uh, to the Shoemaker protocol? Great question, because I, I'm bound and determined to get well, as you know from all my illnesses. And so I was just pushing through, and I was like, what the heck? I don't care. I'm just going to push through. But what I did do, I took high doses of quercetin, vitamin C, and I took, took high doses of Benadryl at night, and it really controlled it enough so that I could work and live and survive during that two months. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that that example because I'm yeah. sure, you know, it's always practical examples that that's Exactly. <laughs> so, so I think that's great. Thanks. Uh, next slide. Thanks. Okay, so jumping a little bit more into testing for for MCAS, and as you've already said, really the you know there are a number of different diagnostic tests that exist, but none of them are are perfect, and and that perhaps contributes to the to the diagnostic difficulty with this this disorder. So I'm wondering if you you'd like to talk a little bit more around some of the biomarker testing and and uh, what you've found about it, and you know the reliability and so on. It is so difficult. Gosh, I have so many people say, well, can you test me for mast cell activation? And by all means, I'm happy to test. But first of all, when I've looked at our conventional labs, LabCorp and Quest in the US, no one lab can do all these tests for me. So just like Sears diagnosis, it can be kind of tricky to get the labs. And then secondly, these are very, they have to be handled, as you've written in these beautiful slides, um, they have to be handled like the histamine, the heparin, they have to be handled extremely carefully, put on ice immediately. And if your lab tech or your lab doesn't know how to handle it, it will be inaccurate. So there's lots of nuances with just ordering the test and getting the sample, let alone the actual results. Then when you get the results, what often happens, serum tryptase is probably your easiest. So if you screen, often as I'm doing the serum, labs I'll throw in a serum tryptase because that's easy to do you can also do whole blood histamine those two are my most common um, first line because they're easy to order through most labs and they're fairly accurate now the problem is a lot of people we, we talked about clonal disorders clonal disorders they'll often have abnormalities here but many of our mast cell activation patients will have normal labs and as long as you keep that in mind and know there's only a small percentage of pa patients that actually come up with abnormal labs then you can still test but you may not always find what you're looking for even in a patient who has this syndrome right okay great so uh, and so in Australia for instance you know we, we're able to get the tryptase and the, and the okay. chromogranin A and histamine and the N-methyl histidine however the, the prostaglandin F2 alpha yeah. and prostaglandin D2 are don't appear to be commercially available at this point and and generally the heparin test that's available is not a chilled plasma exactly. sample so uh, and and my experience so far is a lot of patients who clinically appear to have it uh, these lab tests may not may not be outside the normal reference ranges, and uh, and so so that can be tricky. Um, interestingly, the whole blood uh, histamine rather is something I already do as part of my basic workup um, for you know mainly for methylation. 
Uh-huh. Um, as, 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 as you know, the Walsh Pfeiffer um, yes. approach uses whole blood histamine as a marker of a surrogate marker of total methylation. And, uh, and, and so people, so we have a, a whole bunch of people in Australia who, who have a high histamine who we who refer to as under methylators. Yeah. And that, that, I guess that speaks to, I don't know if you'd like to speak very briefly about the connection between methylation and, and mast cells, um, but it appears to be, it appears to be an important connection. Absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up because that's key and so many people are interested in their MTHFR status and so I would love to talk about that. One thing I wanted to mention that just to be clear, this is a clinical diagnosis as is many things. So the tests are um, um, ancillary and they're important and if your doctor can order them, wonderful. If they're positive, wonderful. But as Dr. Gupta and I know, this is really one of those clinical diagnoses with someone with symptoms who responds to treatment. And Dr. Thea Reedy is one of the main experts um, in mast cell activation disorders, agree that really blood uh, tests can't uh, confirm or deny the presence of this illness. So back to methylation. So methylation, and as we know, one of the main markers, there's many other uh, genes that play into it, but MTHFR, a lot of people know their status or have heard or read about MTHFR A1298C and, and C677T. When people have mutations in those methylation genetics, they have impaired methylation. And if they don't have enough active methylfolate or active um, methyl B12 or P5P or riboflavin, they're prone to have problems with methylation. Methylation is one of the pathways our bodies uses to make to break down histamine. And because of that, if you have impaired methylation or deficiencies of those B vitamins, with the genetic mutation, you're going to be really prone to problems with excess histamine. It's basically because your body can't break it down. So there's other genes as well, like DAO and uh, MAO enzymes, but the MTHFR tends to be a big one in the breakdown of histamine. Great, and and so if people if people you know are showing the signs of of under methylation and and the certain the certain symptoms they could look up online, uh, particularly on on Dr. Walsh's website, and if they they're running a high histamine, uh, is there any particular methylation support that you generally recommend um, for these patients? I do. Yeah, so pretty much I will check all my patients for MTHFR status because I do feel even though there's many other genes, that tends to be a big player and and it's something we can clinically um, intervene and help them with. So um, methyl B12, in some patients uh, they do really well with just methyl B12. Some methylfolate um, order of adding those in can be very important. I find that B12 is the first one to add in and then the methylfolate uh, secondary. And then uh, cofactors such as SAMe, magnesium, zinc, riboflavin, P5P are all critical. So sometimes I use a formula with all of the B vitamins in it and maybe some magnesium and zinc. Um, The end point of uh, MTHFR and methylation pathways is actually the production of glutathione. Glutathione helps us deal with toxic exposure and liver um, detox. And so sometimes giving them liposomal forms of glutathione if they have impaired production of glutathione um, will also be helpful in the methylation issues. Okay, great. Thank you for this. Okay, uh, next slide. Thanks. Okay, so the other really important side to this is there can be an overlap, as you know, Dr. Jill, with with MCAS and other conditions. And... um, you know, it often patients with MCAS may have various other allergies and asthma. It can coexist with autism, autoimmune disorders, etc. And most importantly, as far as this call is, is concerned, there, there's a roundabout, appears to be around about a 30 to 50 percent overlap with chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Uh, would you like to talk a little bit about the the overlap with other conditions and, and how, you know, what sort of challenges does that present in, in clinical practice? Yeah, so what I find is that, like, for example, the list there, including SEERS, those tend to be the primary diagnosis that we look for. And in my assessment, I'll, you know, write a list of, say, Hashimoto's plus SEERS plus IBS. But what we see is that histamine and prostaglandins and the um, the effectors from the mast cells have a big role in a lot of these diseases. And the reason for that is obviously if we think about histamine with allergies and asthma and respiratory distress, that's clear. Um, things like autoimmune disorders and gut issues, GERD, um, IBS are all related to a permeable gut line. We know from Dr. Fasano's research that the three things yes. common to all autoimmune diseases are environmental trigger, genetics, and a leaky gut or hyperpermeability and because histamine and these prostaglandins um, all have an effect on permeability of both the blood-brain barrier and the gut a lot of times there's overlap because 
who knows which came first, the chicken or the egg, but those, those um, things that the mast cells secrete can cause a lot of these symptoms. So they definitely overlap. And what I find the mast cell diagnosis and treatment comes when I'm hitting a wall or when I'm finding patients that I've tried to treat and they're not getting better, then I start to look for the MCAS diagnosis. Great, yeah. So it, and it's all, almost like it seems to me these days, Dr. Jill, that it's more the the rule rather than the exception for patients to have multiple diagnoses rather and multiple syndromes going on rather than just one. And it, it seems like the the old medical rule that generally patients just have one diagnosis seems to not apply anymore. And just the complexity of of uh, of, of patients and and their presentation seems to be increasing. Absolutely. I don't know if you're noticing that. I agree. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you. All right, so jumping on a little bit uh, to chronic inflammatory response syndrome, and I know most people listening to this uh, webinar will be already familiar with this syndrome, but just talking a little bit around the, the theory of how this is developed and how this can link in with uh, mast cell activation syndrome. So as we've already said, there's around about a 30 to 50% uh, crossover between CIRS and MCAS and so maybe understanding the mechanism of how CIRS develops can help us understand how this crossover is so common. Uh, so talking a little bit around toxins to start with, so as we know firstly the problem is not just mold and mold spores, uh, it's, it's a whole microbial soup that we can pick up from a water damage building or from a tick bite. Uh, um, and uh, it's important to know that if you get a tick bite, it's not just Lyme disease that you need to be worried about. There's actually, that's another microbial soup where there can be up to 15 different organisms that, that, that people can pick up from tick bites. And so biotoxins and inflammagens that are either inhaled from a water damage building or, or taken in through the blood via a, a tick bite or other vector bite, uh, they can it can cause in certain people who are genetically predisposed to to have this chaotic and inefficient inflammatory response so basically if you've got a gene type like you know the, the most classically described one is called 4353 mm -hmm. uh, and if you have this gene type and that's been activated by uh, an infection of some sort, whether it be a viral infection such as Coxsackie virus or Epstein-Barr virus um, or even a tick bite, then that can lead a person to not be able to have a proper antigen present presentation or they, in other words, they can't create a proper antibody response. And then as a result of that, they have this chaotic and inefficient inflammatory response. And, and we talk about this in, in our course quite a lot. And this then this this chaotic inflammatory response leads a patient to develop a multi-system, multi-symptom illness that that can even persist for years after they're being removed from from the source of that illness. So, in some way, what what happens you could say is that that the host response becomes the illness, and and I think there's a clear crossover here with with MCAS as well, and I think this whole this whole uh, mechan mechanism of development of SIRS that's been described by Dr. Shoemaker and his research team also fits in quite well with MCAT, you could say, in a certain sense, because, again, what's happening is that uh, the immune system is becoming hyperactivated and is, is, is overactive, you could say. Would you like to talk a little bit around that, Dr. Jill, and your thoughts around the, the connection? Uh, brilliant, and it's so true that these toxins that are also triggers to sears can also be triggers to the mast cells. So they very, very closely align, and that's why we see your estimate 30 to 50 percent of people can have both syndromes. Um, and one thing I think is important to understand that I often teach even to other physicians is total toxic load. This concept, I always describe it as we have a bucket ability we're born with, and that ability is, is a conglomeration of our genetics and our ability to get rid of toxins. Those of us with Sears or who have had Sears or have the dreaded or high-risk genotypes, we have a, a more difficult time tagging and identifying these toxins and getting rid of them. And this can cross over. Sears is one aspect of these inflammagens in the toxic soup that you so well described in a water damaged building or from an infection from a tick-borne illness. But what we see is our total toxic burden right now in our environment. This is one of the reasons why these diagnoses are so complex and usually multiple 
in our sick patients is because total toxic burden nowadays is huge for the average person. And what determines whether or not they get ill or stay well is their genetics and their ability to get rid of these toxins out of their body. So once that bucket is full, it starts to overflow on the top with symptoms and illness. And part of our healing the patient is taking that load, that total load down, getting them out of a mold exposure, getting rid of some of the infections. Because if they have margin in the top of their bucket, they're able to detox and they're not so triggered um, in this mast cell activation as well. Right. And so in the same way as one develops SIRS, one develops a hyperactive mast cell mm -hmm. arm to their immune system. And, uh, and, and then, you know, and presumably even like, for instance, if the initial trigger was mold, uh, for many patients, even when they get into a, um, a much more satisfactory building that's, that's not water damaged, they may still continue to have mast cell activation. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. It's almost like once these cells get irritated, it can last for a long time. And I told you my personal story. That was 2015. It's two years later. I'm doing 100% better and no hives, but I definitely could be triggered by allergens or things that could trigger the mast cells. It's still, it's still there. It's like a hungry lion waiting for an antigen to trigger it. And in the right circumstance or exposure, I could still have, and so could my patients, some activation and symptoms. Right. So you don't feed the hungry lion, is that right? Right. <laughs> we avoid that. <laughs> okay, great. Next slide, thanks. Okay, so um, as as you know, there's a whole alphabet soup that we learn when we're we're going through the SIRS physician training with Dr. Shoemaker. And um, as my poor brain at 1 a.m. at night was trying to understand what MSH and VIP and MMP9, <laughs> TGF beta 1 were, it's it's now part of my my everyday alphabet. Uh, and it's interesting to also note that there is an interaction with many of these SERS biomarkers and mast cells. Um, would you like to to talk a little bit around uh, those SERS biomarkers and 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 how they they interact with mast cells and how they may give us a clue as to what might be going on with our mast cells? You bet. And beautiful job on these slides. This is just so nice um, and so concise. And what's interesting is I love the interplay because it all starts to make sense when you understand these markers that we look at with Sears and how they affect the mast cells and why there's such an overlap in these two conditions. MSH is something we see low all the time in Sears. And obviously we know Marcons can inhibit MSH. And the interesting thing is we talked about histamine and prostaglandins and increasing permeability of the blood brain barrier and of the gut and all that that entails and how the diseases that it causes. Well, MSH is one of those things that if it's low, you almost always have a situation with massive permeability. So getting that MSH up is another way to help with intestinal and blood-brain barrier permeability issues. And this, if, if it's normal, it actually induces mast cell death. So some of that excess activation would be toned down a bit when the MSH is normal, which it usually is not in Sears. Um, VI, VIP, this is very interesting, and I don't know if you know this, Dr. Gupta, but there's a small percentage of people that actually have increase in histamine with VIP use, and there's a documented yeah, um, no, study on well. Yeah. So what's interesting with this is in these people with mast cell disorders, some of them have to be a little bit careful with VIP because it can trigger some um, respiratory issues or shortness of breath, almost like a wheezing types of thing. It's rare. But it's not a, a panacea to everyone if you have mast cell issues. And so just a caution, and obviously you would talk to your physician about the appropriateness of use. There usually is a time and a place where it can be used. Um, MMP9 is also released by mast cells, and we see this elevated in Sears. So whether it's the um, mold and water damage building, toxic soup inducing mast cells, which are inducing elevation of MMP9, which we measure, or some other um, form, we see this all together in Sears as well. Um, TGF beta, same thing, also released by mast cells. And then interesting, C4A we more typically see with mold. Um, C3A we more typically see with a bacterial trigger, but um, C3A can actually activate mast cells while C4A can inhibit. That's very interesting to me because we can see mast cell activation in both elevations of C4A and C3A. Um, even though one of them activates and one of them inhibits. And then once again, just like the MMP9 and TGF beta, the VEGF is released by mast cells as well. And we see this elevate, elevated in Sears as well. 
Okay, great. So, so it sounds like that these biomarkers are extremely useful tests and, and mm -hmm. often do point towards a diagnosis of SIRS, but in some cases, they can also be elevated by other conditions, and, and, and mm -hmm. M MCAS sounds like it, it is one of them. And, and, and Dr. Raj Patel on the last webinar also said something very surprising, which is that in some patients, he had found that addressing uh, mast cell activation and putting them on a low histamine diet, in fact, had lowered their, uh, their SIRS biomarkers markers such as MMP9 and TGF beta 1 and someone's and have you have you seen that happen at all in, in practice? Uh, absolutely. Uh, there's been a few cases where I really believed it was Sears and we kept looking and either didn't find a trigger or they'd been out of the exposure and treating the MCAS brought everything normal and to me that was pretty eye-opening. Great. So, so I think we're seeing more and more as we go along that there's 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 a little bit of a non-specificity to these tests, and yeah. and we always need to keep our keep our eyes open at what the possibilities could be. Uh, would you like to talk about? I guess this this goes back to your total toxic load idea. I don't know if you have any further comments on 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 this idea of removing triggers to remove to reduce the total toxic load. Yeah, so this is a beautiful example because this funnel could represent your bucket very, very similarly as my um, analogy was. And basically, as your bucket gets more full and sears, is, this is a massive load. So that could be a, a large percentage of the load in the bucket. But other allergens and toxic metals and chemicals and plastics and pesticides. So just getting someone in a clean environment and clean food. I always, um, when I'm lecturing, I say clean air, clean water, clean food. That is the basis of health. And sometimes we forget and we want use lots of medications and supplements but clean air clean water clean food is such a core and that's where it starts so making sure you're not loading your body with toxins just with your makeup or your bath and body products or your cleaning products that's pretty simple and clean food so making sure you're eating organic local if possible grass fit all the kinds of things that have a less toxic load for your body and what we find is sometimes this can feel overwhelming because we're getting um, exposures from all kinds of chemicals and things in our food supply and our air supply but all we need to do is remove part of the load. So all we need is a little bit of margin to start to heal. We don't need to remove everything. Now, in the case of mold, you really need to avoid the mold. But in all these other toxic chemicals, it's not that you have to find 100% of the toxins and clear 100% out. Patients will, our bodies want to heal. And so as long as you give some margin and you take away some of the major toxins and decrease the load, the patients will get well. And that's kind of exciting because otherwise it feels overwhelming to deal with all of these things. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like that. And I, I often tell my patients that it's it's really what you do 99% of the time that matters. And if you very occasionally slip up and um, and have a big ice cream, well, enjoy it and get and get back on the program. <laughs> absolutely. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, uh, and so there has there does appear to be some supplements which can be of benefit in in MCAS, and uh, and and there's a whole long list of them. But I'm wondering if you could talk around uh, the supplement side of this and and which you found to be most helpful. Sure, um, I love this because I find the natural mast cell stabilizers can be very very effective. Um, my favorite is quercetin, hands down. Almost anyone with mast cell disorders or allergies, I start in quercetin, and that along with vitamin C, which can be often in a powder together or separate, um, can be extremely helpful. Vitamin C or ascorbic acid is a natural mast cell stabilizer and antihistamine, and almost everyone it can use it, and it's quite safe for nearly everyone, including children. So both quercetin and ascorbic acid, there's almost no contraindications to those two and those are two I use in nearly every patient who has mast cell issues okay, um, and just a quick question on that dr. Jill do you ever use intravenous in these cases or would it almost always be oral Great question. IV vitamin C would be very, very helpful in these patients, but whether it be IV Myers cocktail or glutathione or vitamin C, what I find is there's sp uh, spikes and then they'll go back down. So I'd almost rather do a daily dosing of liposomal form or some form where they're getting absorption daily than an infrequent IV. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. And then B6 and P5P play into multiple things. They help us. They are cofactors in the breakdown of histamine, including methylation. So they can be extremely helpful for that reason. Um, some people don't do well with B6, but P5P or pyridoxal 5-phosphate is the active form, and that can be tolerated in almost all of our patients, and it's a little bit more um, easily bioavailable to the body. Um, Omega-3s are huge, and we use this in Sears, too, to kind of calm the inflammation and, and decrease the reactivity. And this is powerful anti-inflammatory 
inflammatory antiprostaglandin. And that's why, because mast cells produce some of the inflammatory prostaglandins and the omega-3 pathway actually inhibits that. So that can be real powerful. And I frequently use fairly high doses in inflammation and autoimmune disease, anything from four to six grams at times of the fish oil. Um, curcumin is interesting. Curcumin can be very helpful anti-inflammatory, but in certain people it can actually induce histamine. So I do want to say a caution with curcumin. There's a small percentage of people that actually don't do well with curcumin, um, and, but it is an anti-inflammatory. It's often anti-pain. It's anti-cancer. It's got some wonderful benefits, but not everyone with mast cell disorders benefits for, from curcumin. Alpha lipoic acid, another thing that can be done IV, but super helpful. And um, most of my patients take a small dose. I actually prefer R lipoic acid um, over alpha lipoic, but both of them are very effective. N acetylcysteine, for multiple reasons, is effective. Um, it's a precursor of glutathione. It's a good um, a respiratory support for the lungs and sinuses. And again, a lot of patients do very well on NAC. And a lot of these, you can do multiple things at the same time, or you can uh, find what works best. But this list of natural Natural anti sorry antihistamines. Many of my patients are on all of them. SAMe is a, is a universal methyl donor, so that whole methylation pathway it can be very helpful in adding in when the patients can't create methylation products. And then we mentioned B12 and methylfolate, and those are also enhancing methylation as well. Right. And DAO enzymes, let's talk a little bit about that. That can be profoundly helpful for food-induced histamine reactions. So some of these patients, their load of histamine is so high because their mast cells are activated that a little bit of histamine from food can be a huge trigger. And I think you have a slide in a few moments we'll talk about specific foods. But something that can be powerful is mealtime inhi inhibition of histamine or breakdown of histamine. And that can be done through a European formula. I think they're the only ones that make it now, and that's called Umbrellax DAO and you can take one or two caps with your meals. And again, some people are react to all kinds of foods, so they take it with every meal. Some people just take it with the high histamine foods, and it really helps that mealtime reactivity and symptoms. Um, one of the things that's not on your slide that can be helpful for mealtime reactivity is chromalin. Um, another name for that is... Um, I'm blanking on the, the name, but chromalin is the, the generic name for that, and that can be taken in ampules with meals to decrease the histamine activation as well and the reactivity. Gastrochrome is the um, brand name of that. And then probiotics, I'm so glad you put this up here because certain probiotics actually decrease histamine and other probiotics can actually increase histamine. So if you're a person with MCAS, you actually need to be very careful about not only your gut microbiome and what composes it because your own gut bugs, enterococcus, streptococcus, and yeast can actually produce histamine. And certain uh, probiotics like lactobacillus casei can increase histamine as well. We know bifidobacter species actually decrease histamine and lactobacillus rhamnosus may decrease or is at least neutral with histamine production. Okay, great. And um, so there's, there's quite, it's good to see that there's so many supplements that can be of benefit in this disorder. And uh, another really important part of, of the treatment, just as, as many of the different disorders we, we treat in functional medicine, are, um, is diet. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit around the low histamine diet and, 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 and really how people can get their head around this. And also keeping in mind, there seems to be a number of different low histamine diets around and yeah. uh, how people can find uh, one that, that seems to be reliable. Yeah, so um, some of my patients have gotten to know the low histamine chef. I don't know her website, but she's got a great work, and she talks a lot about this, and she's a chef, so she knows about meal prep, and that's a great resource for patients who want to know more. Um, if you think about things that are either fermented or aged or have sat around a long time like leftovers, those are commonly producers of histamine. So the more something starts to decay, it's going to produce histamine. And just understanding that will help you kind of remember what might be histamine containing. So most smoked meats, aged meats, um, things like aged cheeses or wines, um, alcohol, chocolate and nuts can be an issue. So there's lots of different things that are listed here that can be pickled foods, and those are typically problematic with patients with histamine issues. So even though um, these don't by themselves create mast cell disorders, they're part of that load, part of the funnel or the bucket. And if you try to decrease your exposure through foods, you may lower your histamine load enough so that it's not a big problem for you. Okay, great. And do you recommend generally that patients uh, try this diet before trying some of the supplements or, or is there no one right answer for everyone? 
So some people really have this mealtime problem, so they have stomach pain or diarrhea or they really notice my symptoms or congestion or sneezing or headache or migraine. When their symptoms are really correlated with mealtime, then I go towards the Umbrellix DAOs, the chromalin or gastrochrome and the foods. There's a lot of people that it doesn't matter mealtime or not, there's not really an association with foods and then they don't need to worry quite so much. But I would say most people with mast cell disorders, um, alcohol, chocolate, um, uh, aged foods, fermented foods may be a trigger for things like a migraine headache. So um, often when they're really activated and very, very sick, just decreasing histamine in their diet will help them a lot. So I would say most people, we start like quercetin and a lower histamine diet at the same time. Okay, great. And also just to mention in a lot of gut healing programs, um, we're talking a lot these days about bone broths and, and fermented foods. However, I guess it's worth noting that they're, they're a, a bit of a caution food for, for people with, with, with mast cell issues. Uh, could you talk around that a little bit? 100% agree. I love bone broth. It's amazing for gut healing. But what happens is just because it's a cooked and the, the meat is, 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 is um, more histi high in histamine, it can be a huge trigger for our patients with mast cell issues. So the bone broth proteins and the bone broths themselves are probably a no-no if you have mast cell disorders. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. All right, and then that takes us to pharmaceuticals. And of course, you know, with uh, these kind of disorders, we really have all the different tools available to us. So we don't um, we don't shun even pharmaceuticals uh, if they're needed, and particularly in patients who are not getting better with the basic things uh, such as diet and supplements. And uh, just wondering if you'd like to to share how and and when in the process of treatment you might tend to bring in a pharmaceutical agent and, uh, and, and, and in which way you found them helpful. You bet. And um, like I said before, almost everybody gets quercetin and, and vitamin C. Those are simple and easy and safe. And then we start to add these things when patients aren't responding. And a lot of people do very well on medication. The first H1 blocker is kind of a, a given just because we know, I mentioned in my situation, Benadryl was a profoundly helpful. And Benadryl tends to be very, very helpful, but the drowsiness can be a problem for some people. So if they do find that helpful, they just take that at bedtime. But Zyrtec, Zantec, these um, newer generation antihistamines can be just as effective and they can take them daily with minimal side effects. And then the H2 blockers, often Zyrtec, Zantec, the two Zs are taken together because you have an H1 and an H2. But you could really combine any two of these um, together so that the patient gets an H2 blocker and an H1 blocker. Um, and really, trial and error is where it's at. Because mast cell activation is chemical triggered, a lot of the excipients in these um, commercially produced medications are triggers. So there's very frequently times where we have to compound one of these medications for a patient. I had one, I have a very sick MBAC cast patient where we've compounded so many different things and it's gotten quite expensive till we found um, what was working. And it can be a trial and error thing that can really be difficult. But it's worth trying every single one of these if you have an issue because sometimes one of them will work and the others won't. Um, two that aren't mentioned here that I think are important would be um, something like a compounded ketotophen. That's kind of a generalized mm -hmm. mast cell stabilizer. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> there they are. Um, so the I find the chromalin I mentioned with mealtime and the ketotophen to be extremely, extremely helpful for many of these patients. And ketotophen is not commercially available, but um, at least in the U.S. it can be compounded quite easily, and it's not very expensive. Um, the other things that are listed there are the leukotriene inhibitors, and those can be very helpful, like a daily singular. I usually add these things on to the H1 and the H2 blockers. And one interesting thing that's not listed here and not commonly known is benzodiazepines actually have an antihistamine effect as well. And while I don't like to get patients um, uh, dependent on those medications, for some people who are very sick, the benzodiazepines can be very helpful. Great. So it sounds like there, there's a number of different pharmaceutical options. And if we could just uh, backtrack one slide, uh, thanks. Just a quick question around the H2 blockers and particularly like Zantac and Tagamet. Um, as we know in, in integrative medicine, quite a lot of patients do tend to have low stomach acid. And do you ever find that, that, that using the use of a H2 blocker, which actually to some degree blocks stomach acid production, uh, can be an issue in terms of people's digestion um, or, or the stomach acid production? Production. 
what a beautiful point because we just talked about B12 being critical to uh, methylation and obviously this would inhibit absorption B12 if there's low stomach acid. So um, what I find is typically in the severe activation period, which could be several months, six months, up to a couple years, sometimes these things are critical and, and life-saving and so short-term use. But you mentioned such a beautiful point because the shortest use possible of any of these things is the best. And I do find people get out of this, um, you know, as long as they're avoiding exposure and decreasing toxic load, they don't need these things forever. Okay, great. Yeah, that, that's a simple solution. And and I guess if they're on proton pump inhibitors as well, that might also yeah. be another small pump, uh, another small point that, that mixing those with something like Zantac and someone could be a bit of a double whammy yeah. to the stomach, stomach acid. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're getting up towards the end here. So really just to to put this in context for people who are, who are dealing with complicated chronic illness and uh, particularly that involves mold exposure and who may be wondering about, well, where in the, where in the process might I start thinking about mast cell activation syndrome? This is actually a, a diagram that came from Dr. Raj Patel in the last, in the last mm -hmm. webinar, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about this and, and this is a possible a possible flow chart for, for the different steps they may care to look at. Uh, I love this because I would agree. Obviously, removal from the source is, is key because you can't even come close to getting those mast cells under disorder unless you get the, the main trigger, which often is a water damage building and the inflammagens associated with it out of the picture. So that is by far number one. You'll never be able to overcome that with quercetin or vitamin C. So um, getting them out of the exposure. And then I do think dealing with the MCAS is huge because it affects, just like Sears, there's so much overlap with the brain and the brain fog and the gut issues and the heart issues and the POTS and the orthostatic issues and all of those symptoms very much um, cross uh, over into Sears. And so getting the mast cells a little bit less activated and the histamine level down will often give the patient a lot of relief. And the nutrient support would probably go right along with that because you need all those cofactors and nutrients we talked about. And then the infections come later. Now, that may be months later or weeks later. It doesn't have to be a long time. But I do think stepwise, removing from exposure and then treating the infections um, is a great, um, a great order of operations. What's interesting, too, is that the infectious load, I think, also comes from the weakened immune system in a water damage building. So these things are so correlated because if the person is in a water damage building, all of a sudden their immune system goes offline. And so their old infections or things that maybe weren't bothering them, the viral load, the parasites, they tend to pop up because their weakened immune system is present. So I think this order is a very, very um, appropriate way to look at it. Great, thank you for that, and and hopefully that gives a little bit of clarity for for people who are who are dealing with mold related problems. Okay, next slide, thanks. Okay, so just finally um, talking a little bit about uh, the mold illness made simple course very quickly before we get into questions. Uh, really, I just want to explain that this this really has come through a uh, a passion that I had um, for people getting through this syndrome, and I'm not sure if you've seen this, Doctor Jill, but over here. Uh, I found that a lot of patients were very, very overwhelmed when they mm -hmm. found out they, they had SIRS and they found out that they're in a water damage building. And, and what I found sometimes was that overwhelm leads to paralysis. And sometimes that mm -hmm. could, the overwhelm could lead them to actually not do anything or not to, to move through the syndrome. And part of the overwhelm seemed to be that the information was just too confusing and there was too much of it. And basically people didn't think that they could understand the whole thing. And that appeared to be part of, of, of the confusion. And so, as, as I told you, I don't know if you had to do this as well, but when I learned about SIRS, I had to read a couple of hundred page documents called the GAO guidelines and the WHO guidelines on, um, yes. on water damage buildings. And they were the most confusing. I mean, they were great documents, but, you know, if you're not feeling well due to mold, uh, the, the ability to actually... You don't want to read. You don't want to go through those documents. So really, what you want is this: you want to just go through someone who's made it really simple and has gone through the basic points and just given you the key points and nothing else. And uh, that's what I created with Mold Illness Made Simple. And um, and really, it is a big shortcut. And I really believe that it can cut through the overwhelm very quickly. Next slide, thanks. So really just to explain what's involved, it's a, it's a 
access at any time course so it doesn't run at specific times but basically what we have is is eight weeks in which there's actually 18 modules and each module consists of video lectures and slides and there's a there's a PDF workbook for each chapter that you can download uh, there's also weekly quizzes to make sure that you you've comprehended the information okay and and if you're not scoring well on those that can be a trigger to go back and uh, and read the information again uh, there's also a private Facebook Facebook group where we are starting to discuss newer areas such as mast cell activation syndrome and Lyme-like illnesses and uh, and various other uh, nuances which are coming up in this syndrome and uh, and one of the most important sections to in the course is remediation and one of the keys if you are looking at getting a house remediated is you can't just get any IEP or any indoor environmental professional you need to make sure that the IEP is familiar with SIRS and is is knowledgeable to deal with that and, and I actually believe that the course is worth it just for that point and just for the questions to ask an IEP I don't know if you found that in your area dr. Jill but we've no, really had, yeah that can be a real stumbling block for people if, if they're if they're going to to people who don't really understand SIRS and they're really only wanting to get their house to a cosmetic level of of uh, of, of cleanliness that can just in, introduce a whole level of confusion that's not needed okay next next slide thanks so yeah basically the mold illness made simple course is is a, a very simple way of going through this this illness and uh, and to understand the alphabet soup um, after this webinar, we are offering a 25% off uh, deal, and the, the code is uh, BEATMCAS. And uh, there'll be a link below in the YouTube, once this comes up on YouTube, that you can actually uh, click on to get through uh, to the sign-up page and, and use that, uh, that particular coupon code. But I don't know, do you, have you had any feedback from, from patients, Jill, about the course and, and whether it has helped them in any way? I 110% endorse this course. I think it's amazing. I think you've done a phenomenal job to a very complex topic. I know when you first put the course out, you um, allowed me to, uh, to go through it as well, and I thought it was well done, well worth every penny. And I really encourage you, if you are confused or overwhelmed, get the course. It's You can do it on your own time. You can go back and check it out. I, I highly recommend it. Great. Thank you, Jill. I really appreciate that. Okay, great. And so if it's okay with you, Jill, we'll now move on to, to questions and answers. And, and we do have a yeah. number of different questions and answers. And uh, it's always interesting to see what people will ask and the different nuances they'll bring out. So if that's a, okay with you, I'll, I'll jump into those now. Yeah. Okay, great. So this is a really interesting one. How can the role of mast cells in the maintenance of a healthy gut microbiome be optimized in, in chronic situations where gut mast cell activation, uh, activation and symptoms could be a stumbling block to recovery? Wow. So this is so correlated because if the mast cells are out of control, you're going to have a permeable gut. And as we talked about with Sears, if you have a low MSH, you're going to have a permeable gut. There's evidence now that things like Crohn's disease and colitis are uh, correlated in some cases with low MSH. And as we know, mast cells and, and low MSH, it all co goes together. So really, you have to get the histamine under control in order to heal the gut. Now, we talked about order of operations, but one thing I always say with healing the gut, you cannot just throw glutamine or gut healing powders at the gut if you don't treat the infections and the activation. So you have to start with looking for dysbiosis or hidden infections, treating them, and then starting to lower histamine and, heal, and elevate MSH and heal the gut. You'll never heal the gut unless you deal with the histamine and the mast cell issues. Great. Thank you. And, and also a linked question. Can hidden food allergies intersect with mast cell activation syndrome, SIRS, and chronic infections? Yes, and so 100% this is connected, and the reason is because food systemic food reactions happen when there's a permeable gut. So in this case, we talked about there's obviously gut permeability, and when that happens, you have the leakage of the food contents, endotoxins from the bacteria, yeast, and other things into the systemic blood circulation. The immune system reacts because it thinks it's a threat, and then it creates these antibodies to things like um, beef or um, eggs or dairy and the patient will develop food allergies and as we just said when there's histamine when there's mast cell activation when there's low MSH you're going to have permeability issues in the gut 
So you have to deal with that permeability issue and mast cell activation first. Great, thank you. Now, this next question is a little bit more personal, and we're not, of course we're not giving medical advice on, on this call, but in just to, in, as a general way to approach this problem, I get a, a red patch on my upper cheeks and lower eyes. It comes out every few days, and, and it's tender to touch, like a burning cessation. Could this be a symptom of MCAS? So any sort of skin redness, redness is classic, rubber and heat with histamine and inflammation. So there's some sort of inflammatory reaction going on. We don't know what's causing that, but could this be a mast cell activation uh, type of reaction? Yes. Could it be something else? Yes. That's the, uh, unfortunately the answer is it could be, yeah. but it could also be something else. Right. So presumably this person could uh, explore it with their physician yes. and perhaps consider doing some of the MCAS testing. And yes. uh, and if it's looking suggestive, they could try some of the, the yes. treatment and see if they get a response. Uh, okay. So this is a, another very topical one. I've been treating SIRS for some time, but never looked into MCAS for my case. My TGF beta 1 and MMP9 continue to remain elevated despite treatment. Uh, for those without obvious MCAS symptoms, can the low histamine diet help? You know, the thing about the low histamine diet is anyone can try it. It's free. It's not difficult. You could try it for 30 days and see how you respond. So I would say that's such a low-cost, safe alternative for someone to try that anyone who would be interested in trying it could try it for 30 days and see if it helped. Right. Yeah, that's just a, a simple, a simple yeah. thing they could do. Okay, this is a really good one as well. Do folks with the low MSH HLA gene or the one five gene uh, generally have they been seen to have more MCAS? Typically, is there is there any correlation you can point out? Ooh, that would be a fascinating research, but I don't know of any data to support it. And it might be the case. We just I don't think we know. Right. Yeah, I, th I think that's true. And, and I, I've seen a number of patients who just have low MSH and not the other, the yeah. other biomarkers of SIRS. And it does seem that in some cases their problem is predominantly gastrointestinal. Yes. Uh, okay. And uh, this next one's not 100% clear, but the person is asking uh, if one has mold, uh, amongst other things, is there still a chance to see some improvement? Presumably they're talking about with the MCAS treatment. And if so, at what level? I have mold, lead, mercury poisoning, inattentive ADHD, candida, SIBO, and likely parasites. Oh, gosh. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but that's not uncommon. That's my classical. I mean, most of my patients are, are that complex. Um, you know, getting out of the mold is huge because that's such a, as we talked in the beginning, that could be the number one in most um, as I know Dr. Uh, Theo Theoridis, who is one of the expert, world-leading experts, he's written multiple articles on MCAS. Almost any reviewed article you read about MCAS will be uh, um, authored by him. And he has said in several of my personal conversations with him that even though he doesn't treat sears and he doesn't know a ton about mold, he sees mold as one of the number one triggers in MCAS. So mold would be my first um, thing to eliminate from your situation. Okay, great. Thank you for that suggestion. Uh, now, this one is on Epstein-Barr virus, and uh, the question is, is there any suggestions on how to treat uh, active EBV in the context of mycotoxin, severe MCAS, post-Lyme, etc.? That's a great question because I see the viral load as a big player in some of these patients because of the weakened immune system. And we'll typically check um, EBV, IgG, VCA, which is the old past infection. We'll check early antigen, IgG, and we'll check nuclear antigen, IgG. And if all three of those are activated, it might be, it might be signaling a reactivation of the Epstein-Barr virus. If that's the case, I will use multiple different um, uh, herbal things in different proportions depending on the patient. Monolaurin can be effective. Olive leaf can be effective. Cemento or cat's claw can be effective. And also there's a um, commercial product they're using at Stanford University called Equilibrant. So all of those things, depending on the patient, can be effective. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And Do Dr. Raj Patel was talking a little bit about narrow band UVB therapy on the last uh, oh, webinar. Is that something you've come across at all? I haven't, but I'd love to okay. learn more. Yeah, he, he, he's pointed out some some studies, so I'm happy to forward them your way. Uh, next one is, could we, in theory, extract and filter bone marrow to reduce mast cells? Uh, we invade it for a small number of stem cells, and I'm wondering if BMSC, uh, bone marrow stem cell, may increase mast cell numbers. Oh, this is fascinating. I think we need research, but it's very, very interesting. That person is thinking outside the yeah, box. Yeah, that's right. 
That's right. It's a great research question, but no data at this point. If no. one, is, oh sorry, we've already asked that one. Could you use chromalin and ketotifen together on some occasions, or is it always one or the other? No, you can use. You can really layer as many of these things as it takes. I um, mean, it is trial and error, and it's layering. And I have uh, multiple patients who are on, you know, five or six different um, supplements or medications or more. Okay, great. So, so most of them can be used together. And uh, you mentioned vitamin C and quercetin as being a really key base to a, a program for MCAS. Could you share what a typical dosage might be that you use in your patients? Um, quercetin can be anywhere from one gram to three to six grams per day. Um, vitamin C, um, usually to bowel tolerance. So if you get too much vitamin C, someone could have loose stools. But typically, I'll dose anywhere from three to five grams on the vitamin C. Okay, great. And this next question is uh, related to SIRS. Is SIRS related to Ehlers-Danlos syndrome? I started becoming hypermobile and losing gum tissue rapidly around the same time the fatigue and brain fog and other symptoms started. Mm. Dr. Gupta, you're probably more of an expert on this yeah. connection. I could tell you. Well, I could tell you about the SIRS connection. Yes, there is yeah. definitely, definitely a big connection with EDS and and SIRS. It's almost like hypermobility syndromes of any type can be considered to be a separate genetic marker yes. for SIRS outside the HLA. And and one of the reasons is that the connective tissue is not as linked, and so that people tend to get a much higher release of TGF beta one. Uh, that's one part of it. Uh, there's also uh, a gentleman called Michael McAvoy from Metabolic Healing, who's who's in Santa Cruz, California, who's been uh, researching uh, EDS particularly and its connection to the RCCX genes. And he's also particularly found that there are there are problems with aldosterone and cortisol mm -hmm. in patients with EDS, and they tend to be much more prone to postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And, uh, and and basically, the, he's describing it as being a problem with the intracellular, extracellular matrix, mm -hmm. rather, in patients with uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And he's actually trialing a number of peptides, growth peptides and so on, to try to boost the quality of the extracellular matrix uh, to enhance the health of people with EDS. So this is really, a, it's a quite an actually an um, interesting upcoming field, and, and we'll definitely keep people updated. And we may do a further webinar with Michael McAvoy. Okay, we're getting a few more questions coming now. How are supplements helpful if they're not being absorbed due to parasites and leaky gut and the villi being flattened? Mm -hmm. Well, it's always tricky because we have a lot of, I have a lot of patients that have very, very impaired digestion. So sometimes we'll use liposomal formulations. We can get liposomal vitamin C, liposomal glutathione, liposomal methyl B vitamins, liposomal CoQ10. So that's a way to kind of bypass the gut and get enhanced absorption. Um, some of these things like chromalin are liquid and they're pretty highly absorbed. Um, so there's ways to move, work around that, but healing the gut simultaneously with controlling the mast cells can be really critical because that is a problem. Great, thank you. And is there any reason to worry that antihistamine treatments would lead to a buildup of histamine, uh, even though it helps with symptoms? Or, or in other words, is it, is it possible that the receptors uh, for, for, for histamine and someone may become upregulated throughout time? So I've had this discussion with um, a one very educated patient, and there seemed to be, I remember this was maybe a year or two ago, that there was some research on um, just like serotonin reuptake inhibitors can have an effect on the receptors. There may be the same effect on some of these H1, H2 blockers, but the bottom line is we don't really know, and I just don't think we have the evidence to say one way or the other. I do think if you feel like any of these things, interventions make a patient worse, of course, you stop them. And I have seen that. I have seen patients where one thing won't work and it'll actually make them feel worse. Okay, great. And Jill, during the SIRS conference, you suggested that oxytocin may be an effective alternative way to treat uh, ADH or arginine vasopressin problems. Uh, have you continued to experiment with this and are you still seeing positive results? I have, and I am still seeing positive results. Um, the nice thing about oxytocin is I haven't had I haven't had a single patient who had a reverse reaction. Um, in some patients, it doesn't help, but in many of them, it really stabilizes the um, whole posterior pituitary. Mm 
Okay, great. And interesting on the call with Dr. Ackley, we talked about relationship problems in, in mm -hmm. uh, as being a really common thing. And, and it's yeah. possible that there could be a crossover with, with, with low oxytocin and, and low ADH, meaning that, that there can just be a lower attachment between partners when, yeah. when someone's starting to get SERS. And have you found any imp improvement in relationships when patients take oxytocin? Yes, I have. And it's okay. being used in the autistic community as well, just because of that connection, that social connection is impaired. And so there's many types of social disorders where it's being used as well. Okay, great, thank you. And lucky last, is activated charcoal safe to use as a binder for mycotoxins during breastfeeding? Ooh, that's a great question. Charcoal is inert, and so, um, unless you're absorbing nutrients, I, I really can't speak to that safely on mm. the webinar. That'd be an yeah. individual uh, conversation. Yeah, I, I think there's there's not really enough data to answer that question right at this point. But I've, this has been a great webinar, Dr. Jill, and I've certainly learnt a lot myself. And I really hope that the people who have tuned in uh, have a lot better an idea of MCAS now and, and when they might consider looking into it if they're stuff, suffering from SERS or, or from mold-related problems. I want to give a big thank you to Dr. Jill for joining us today and, and also for all the pioneering work she's doing in the functional medicine movement. And uh, and also a thank you to, to Caleb Brud for, for the technical support and uh, content support. And uh, yeah, we look forward to catching up uh, with you sometime soon, hopefully at a, at a conference next year, uh, Dr. Jill. So thank you, thank so you, thank you again. Me. You're very thank welcome. You so much.